how organisms interact with each other in a shared environment. Okay? And remember, within ecology, there's two major groups, symbiotic and non-symbiotic. What does it mean if you're symbiotic? They live harmoniously together and benefit one another. Well, that's a, a flavor of symbiotic called mutualism, but a little bit more broad than that. They just live together. They live together and it's required. Okay? So if you're in a symbiotic relationship, you live with your neighbors and it has to happen that way. What about a non-symbiotic relationship? You live together, but you could care less, right? Doesn't matter if they're there or not. Okay? It's not required. So in symbiotic, we've got a couple different flavors. Mutualism, commensalism, satellitism, and parasitism. What is mutualism? And this is what you talked about earlier. They both benefit. Both benefit, right? So it's required and both like it. What about commensalism? Required, one's happy, one doesn't care. What about parasitism? One benefits and the other one is actually hurt by it. Okay, and again it is required. And then the tricky one, what about satellitism? So it's required, but no direct interaction. Okay? So one poops out something, the other eats it, and allows it to live, but they're not interacting directly. Non-symbiotic relationships, and here we have synergism and antagonism. What is synergism? So they benefit from the relationship, but it's different than mutualism because it's not required. So it's not required, but everyone benefits. How common is this? Rare. Rare, right, not common. What about antagonism? What's this? Trying to kill each other. Everyone's trying to kill each other, right? They're in the same shared environment, it's not required, and they hate each other. How common is this? It's very common, right? Welcome to the real world. Alright, binary fission. What is binary fission? Asexual process where one bacteria becomes two, right? This is one way that bacteria can grow. Does anyone remember the other way bacteria can grow? Sexual reproduction. No, bacteria can't do that. They get fat or they make babies, right? So they either get fatter or they go through binary fission. So those are the two ways they can grow. Get fat or divide. And they can do this pretty quickly. And what is it called, uh, or what is the, the amount of time required to go from one cell to the other called? Doubling time, right? So this is the amount of time it takes for one cell to become two. And remember, this is determined by the organism itself. So, to figure this out, we have a nice little formula. I will not give you this on the exam, okay? So you have to remember the formula. I know it's very difficult, but I'm not giving it to you. So, what are all these parts? What's NF? Number of organisms. So this is, F stands for final number of organism. What about NI? Initial. 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 And then N? Ratio between... Ratio between... Elapsed and... So total time over the doubling time. Okay. And if we were to use this calculation and look at multiple different time points, how would this look on a graph? Exponential, so like this. However, is that really what it looks like in the real world? No. Why? 
shit happens. So, in the real world, it looks like this. We've got a number of organisms, and we've got time. Goes like this, and then drops off. And we can break this up into four different curves. What is the first curve called? The lag phase. What's happening during the lag phase? Cells get fatter. Cells getting fatter. They're not dividing. So they're fat. What about this second curve? What's this called? So exponential or the log phase. And what's happening here? They're rapidly dividing at their true doubling time. Nutrients are plenty. What about the next curve? What's happening here? Well, first of all, what's this called? Stationary. Stationary. And what's happening here? They run out of nutrients. They run out of nutrients. So there's no division. But it's not enough to kill them yet. And lastly, what's this curve called? Death. Death. And what's happening here? They're dying because low nutrients, increased waste, which means increased death. Do you guys know that some of them don't die? Um, nah, we should be okay with that. But it's good that you remember. Yeah. Should we possibly know that formula, like to do it, or just the part, like the definitions of what each of those stands for? Like, what's the code number? You have to know both. Okay. Because so. I mean, if you know the formula but you don't know the <coughs> definitions, then it's difficult to put numbers in. Because it would be a word problem. It's not going to be here's all the parts to it. And you said you solve for n first, right? Yeah. You well, yeah. You <laughs> want to solve for n first, right? And then you can basically stop. Unless you bring a calculator, which I'm not requiring you to do. It's just to prove to me that you A, can remember the formula, and B, you know where to put the stuff into the formula. I don't care if you know the math. Okay. We talked about all this already. Alright, it's good enough. Last but not least, everyone's favorite, chapter 8. Okay? This deals with metabolism. What is metabolism? All of the chemical reactions within the cell. And we can group these into two different categories. Anabolic and catabolic. What are anabolic metabolic factors? Taking small molecules and pushing them together to make a cell. Taking small molecules, pushing together, making bigger molecules, which eventually make a cell. Right? So this is building things. What is required for these anabolic, anabolic reactions to occur? Energy. And where does that energy come from? ATP. Good. All right, and that brings us into the catabolic reactions. What are catabolic reactions? Breakdown of bigger molecules into smaller molecules, and what's released in that process? Energy, and what does the cell do with that energy? There's two choices. One is lose it as heat, right? So it gets lost as heat. Ultimately, that's not good, right? It happens a lot. What's the other choice that the cell can do with that energy? Electron transport. Store it in ATP. Okay. That creates ATP, which then can be used for anabolic reactions. So it creates a cycle. Right? You take stuff, you break it apart, release energy, store it in ATP, then use that ATP to put stuff together and make bigger stuff. Okay? Now, for this to occur, we need to use something called an enzyme. What is an enzyme? It is a catalyst, and it is made out of? 
Protein. Good. What do catalysts do? Cause the reaction. It allows the reaction to occur faster because it requires less energy. Okay. So you lower the activation energy required for that reaction to occur. And that's what the enzyme is doing. Remember, they can come in simple and conjugated. What does simple mean? It's just the enzyme. Okay, there's no other bits and pieces required. <coughs> conjugated means it's the enzyme or the protein as well as other bits and pieces called cofactors. And these cofactors can be either coenzymes, which are organic, or metallic ions, which are inorganic. And these proteins have very complex structures and shapes. Why is that important? Why do we care about the shape of an enzyme? It determines what it can bind to. It determines its function, right? So the shape determines its active site, and this is the part that binds to the substrate and then modifies it, okay? And only things that fit into that active site can modify it. If it doesn't fit, the enzyme leaves it alone. Okay, so this determines its specificity. And remember we call this the lock and key mechanism. Only things that fit in the active site get modified. Stuff that doesn't fit just goes away. Enzymes can be found outside of the cell. This is an exoenzyme. Or inside the cell. This is known as an endoenzyme. And they can be either uh, uh, constitutive, which means they're on all the time or regulated, which means they're turned off uh, when no longer needed, or turned on when needed. And remember that all enzymes are doing are redox reactions. So when you really fundamentally break it down, they're shuffling around electrons. They're either destabilizing an electron, breaking a bond apart, and using that electron for uh, production of ATP, or they're stabilizing an electron Okay, uh, interaction, creating a bond and pushing molecules together. That's all they really fundamentally are doing. What is denaturization? So breaking down a protein, right? And this is by unraveling it. And enzymes, as we said, have very complex structure. This is what determines their function. So if you break that down, they will die. Why do we need pathways with enzymes? Right, because one enzyme does a small change. If you want big changes, you need multiple enzymes that kind of just tag team it, right? So go in uh, sequential um, reactions. And then enzymes can be uh, problematic. If you don't have anything for them to do, they can cause problems and kind of break stuff apart or maybe even kill a cell. So the cell needs a way to control them. One way is to inhibit them. Remember, this is where you stop the enzyme from functioning, but you don't get rid of it. There's two types of inhibition, competitive and non-competitive. What is competitive inhibition? It blocks the active site, right? So you have a molecule you make, blocks the active site, doesn't work. What about non-competitive inhibition? Changes the shape. Yep, molecule binds somewhere else, not the active site, changes the shape, and now the enzyme doesn't function. And remember, these are short-term fixes if you want a long-term fix, and you have to go to the DNA, right? Turn the DNA off, and the RNA, the protein, cannot be made. What is an electron carrier? It's in the name. Carries electrons. Good. Carries electrons in the form of a hydrogen ion. Why do we need electron carriers? So electrons aren't lost as heat, right? 
and so that we can then carry them to where we make most of our ATP. Where do we make most of our ATP? Mitochondria or membranes in what process? It begins with an E. Electron transport chain. Remember, most of our ATP is made in the electron transport chain. That only happens at membranes. So we have to carry our electrons to those membranes, and we do that with these guys. Okay? The two big ones are going to be NAD and FAD. And we're doing all of this to make ATP. What is ATP? So it's adenosine triphosphate. It has three phosphates, right? It's a place to store energy. Where do we store the energy in ATP? The bonds of phosphates, right. So each phosphate can be broken off and the process energy is released and we can use it. Or we can slap on new phosphates, storing that energy in that new bond. Okay. And remember, Sometimes we get lucky and we make ATP at the site of a reaction. This is where we don't need electron carriers and we do not need the electron transport chain. Okay? When this occurs, we call it substrate level phosphorylation. So this is magic ATP that just appears, at least for our purposes. All right, on to the pathways. Now, when we talk about catabolism or the production of ATP, we usually talk about one molecule when we're trying to separate out organisms, and that is oxygen. Why do we care so much about oxygen? What does it do at the end of the day? Gives us more ATP by pulling the hydrogens during the electron transport chain. So oxygen is the final molecule in this whole process. Okay. Now, if you use normal oxygen or atmospheric oxygen, O2, you're called aerobic. Okay. How efficient are these guys at making ATP? They're very. They make the most, right? Next, we have anaerobic. These guys don't use oxygen, pure oxygen. They instead use what? So an oxygen molecule, right? Oxygen stuck to something else. So nitrogen or carbon or something else, okay? How efficient are these guys? Right, they're kind of in the middle, right? They're, they're not the worst, but they're not the best. Why would you want to be anaerobic compared to aerobic? What's the benefit? It's more stable, right? Oxygen, elemental oxygen, is a very reactive molecule. So if you Shield it with something else, it becomes less dangerous. Then these losers over here, fermentation. <laughs> Why are these guys losers? They only get two ATP for each glucose. They're very inefficient. But why are they there? What's the benefit of being a fermenter? You don't need oxygen at all. Okay? You don't need oxygen, elemental oxygen, or oxygen in a molecule, no oxygen whatsoever. Okay? So they're losers, but they're not dead. Right? So it's better than dying. <laughs> All right. Now, let me see how much you guys remember. Try not to look at your notes. Okay? Let's start off with glycolysis. So what's the first thing I need to put into glycolysis? Glucose. Plus, what else? ATP, right? How many? Two, right? To give us a little bit of energy. And then at the end of the day, what do I get? Four ATP. Four ATP? Plus? Two pyruvates, two of them. Plus two NADH. NADH is good. I thought before I called this NAD. Why is this one called NADH? Yeah, it has its hydrogen ion, or that electron it can use later on. Okay? 
So that's how you can tell them apart. If it's empty, it's NAD. It's got something in it, it's NAD. Where did these ATP come from? These four ATP. So what is it called when I get ATP at the site of a reaction without the electron transport chain or without electron carriers? Substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation. So these ATP came from substrate level phosphorylation. Good. And how many ATP did I get from glycolysis? Two. two. Put two in, got four. Four minus two is two. Good. Now the Krebs cycle. <laughs> What do we feed into the Krebs cycle? Pyruvate. Plus? Oxygen, right? This guy requires oxygen. And what do we get at the end of the day? Four NADHs plus? One ATP plus one two FADH. One FADH. Are we done? No. No, no. no right? We got one more pyruvate. So we plug it in and we get the same crack. Substrate level, substrate level phosphorylation, right? So right now we've got four ATP, okay? But as I said, we get about 38, so where do most of the ATP come from? The electron transport chain, okay? And where does the electron transport chain happen? For eukaryotes, but more generally speaking, at a membrane, okay? So for eukaryotes, it's the mitochondria. For prokaryotes, it's the cell membrane. Okay. So for each, well, first of all, how many NADHs did we get? Ten. Ten. Four plus four plus two over here. So that's a total of ten NADHs. How many FADHs did we get? Two. And how many ATP did we get from substrate level phosphorylation? Four. Now, what's happening with these NADHs to make ATP? Multiply. We do multiply because each NADH gives you three ATP. What's actually happening here? Remember, the electrons are used to spin something called ATP synthesis. This adds a phosphate to ADP, creating ATP. Okay? And NADH can do this three times per molecule. We multiply this by three, and that gives us 30 ATP. What about FADHs? How many times can they spin ATP synthase? Two. We multiply this guy by two, and that gives us a total of four ATP. 30 plus 4 plus 4 equals 38 ATP. However, we often write it 36 to 38. Why? You should have it. <laughs> Sometimes things go wrong, right? And if it goes wrong, you know, you lose something. Good. That's aerobic respiration. So here's the electron transport chain. Hydrogen ions are being turned through ATP synthase. And the guy that's allowing these to go through ATP synthase is an oxygen molecule. Okay, and that's why we care about oxygen. Anaerobic respiration. So anaerobic respiration looks virtually identical to this. What's the only difference? No oxygen. No oxygen, right? You use oxygen stuck in something else. Okay, good. What about fermentation? Which part of this is fermentation? Glycolysis. Just glycolysis. So 
So how many ATP do you get from each glucose molecule of fermentation? Two. Two. And what are you left with? A shit ton of? Pyruvate. So what does it do with the pyruvate? It processes it, processes it, releases it as what? Waste products that are either acids acid or it could be a, oh. alcohols. Okay, so they're either going to release these as alcohols, like ethyl alcohol, or acids, acetic, susanic, formic, um, or lactic acid. <coughs> What is amphibolism? Right, where it stops in the process of catabolism and goes, hey, I'm not going to tear the shit out of this molecule. I'm instead going to use it for something better. I'll use it as a building block. This ends up saving the organism a lot of energy because it doesn't have to start from scratch. Okay? So an example would be I'm going to stop here, take these pyruvates instead of tearing them apart. I'm going to use them to make an amino acid like beta alanine. It's much easier to start from this than to start from all the you know, basic components. So it's a way for the organism to save or conserve energy. And then anabolism, this is where you take smaller molecules, stick them together, and make larger molecules. And again, you do this over and over and over again until eventually you get a cell. And then when the cell gets to completion, makes itself, it then will make more and more copies of things, and this eventually allows it to divide. Okay? So anabolism is used for making the cell, but also for division. Then last but not least, we've got photosynthesis. What is photosynthesis? Plants do it, right? Cool. What else? What are they, what's, what's the purpose of photosynthesis? Makes glucose. Makes glucose, right? From? Sunlight. Sunlight, but what else? And water. Water, which is a, what kind of molecule? Inorganic, okay? So it's taking inorganic molecules and turning them into organic molecules, like glucose. Why the hell do we care about this? Glucose gives us energy, and where do we get the glucose from? These guys, right? So all the glucose in the ecosystem came from autotrophs, or photosynthetic organisms, okay? Because they're the ones that can take inorganic molecules and make them into organic molecules. But they are not pathogenic. Okay, that's it. Any questions on any of it? Anything? All right, well then uh, have a good weekend and I'll see you on Tuesday. Uh, no. I did. I don't know what I did with it. I think I may have left it at home, so I'm going to freebie today. All of you are here.